Remember Aragorn and Gandalf trying to urge King Theoden in the two towers, you must fight, right? And King Theoden says, I will not risk open war. That is the perfect picture of the church right now. And Aragorn looks at him and he says, open war is upon you. Whether you would risk it or not, it's not something that we invite. It's not something that we choose. It's something that we have been hurled into. And that little boy is a warrior because he's going to need to be a warrior as a man. Standing between you and everything you want in this life, the love, the validation, the healing, the freedom, the influence, right? Your dreams, standing between you and all of that is an enemy that you have to come to terms with. You must fight. Resist him. We're commanded to resist. In Revelation chapter 12, it actually is a great view of Christmas. Revelation 12. You want to see what really happened to Christmas? It wasn't away in a manger. It was this massive battle in the heavens. Michael and Satan and all these angels and demons are fighting it out over the birth of Christ because the birth of Christ is the invasion of the kingdom. Right? The kingdom of God is invading this world. But then here's what it says. After it describes that battle in Revelation 12, there was war in heaven. Then it says, then I heard a loud voice. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of Jesus Christ for the accuser of the brothers. The accuser of our brothers who accuses them day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him, he's talking about the saints, overcame him by the blood of Christ, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much so as to shrink from death. No fear, no fear, no freaking out by the blood of Christ. But he's called the accuser. The first level of this assault comes into us in the form of his spin on your life, his interpretation of events, the way he tries to distort things at the level of accusation, bottom line, those sneering thoughts that are so familiar to you that you think they're coming from your own thoughts, your own head, right? You, that sneer, this isn't for you. It is too late, right? That lie that says, you are disqualified. That voice that says, I know, I know your story. If these guys knew, right, all of that, all of that is coming from the enemy. Don't trust anyone, right? That's from the enemy. God's not coming for you. He's not coming, right? You will never be a man. Right? You'll never get free of this stuff. Or just that, just that more sort of religious voice that says, whoa, tiger, this is a little out there. You know, enjoy this, but kind of moderate it a little. Actually, I am moderated. I'm way toned down. I'm trying not to come on too strong, okay? <laughs> this is 101. All right, but just that sneering voice that just talks about, be comfortable. You're fine. You're fine. You you don't want to get into this. You know, all of it. The accuser of the brethren, right? You missed your opportunity. That was past. I mean, so many ways this comes into us. You married the wrong person, right? These lies that come in, and now here's what's so diabolical about it, is the enemy knows your story, right? And he knows your wounds. He was present for all of them. He caused most of them, right? But he's there with the message of your wounds. He knows your story, so he knows what works with you. Oh, that really sucked. You suck at this. Whatever that is, that meeting at church, that business presentation you did, the attempt to get the graduate degree, whatever it is, you got the beauty, you didn't get the, He knows your story. He knows your father wounds, right? He knows the messages that work with you. 
And until you deal with this, you just get creamed. You just get hammered by it, right? Why do so many guys get taken out? You look at the story in the movie Braveheart, you know, and here are these guys and they want to rise up and they want to fight for their freedom and they're a little hesitant and they're not sure. Everybody wants to be Wallace at some point, right? Let me rush the field. Come on. Right? But most guys end up feeling like Robert the Bruce. You know, he's a good man, but he keeps getting taken out. Every time he wants to rise up, boom. Every time he tries to maybe take a little risk, boom. Every time he tries to be the man, boom. Why? Because of whose voice he's under. He's under the voice of his accuser. What's fascinating is the Satan figure in this scene is his own father, right? When it's the voice you're familiar with, it's really hard to sort out, isn't it? It feels so true. And just the ingredients in that were really striking me again. The mockery of his dreams, (laughs) just kind of the... Just the laugh, the dismissal of his heart's passions. You know, oh, yeah, well, everybody wants that. When you're young, just the mockery of his desires. That's the enemy, right? And then the confusion. He's starting to kind of twist the the facts a little bit. There's some truth in there, but he starts to confuse him. And you can begin to see Robert kind of go, oh, yeah, I guess that's right. And, And then he uses fear. Right? Whoa, what could happen? What could happen? You know, and he brings in that and just seduction, just this seductive voice of deception. And the poor guy is taken out and he does not get free. And Scotland does not get free until he comes out from under that, until he finally rises up against it. And there's this powerful scene where after betrayal after betrayal, he finally tells this, his father, this figure, I will never be on the wrong side again. Right? Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that your brothers are all facing something similar. Because right? one of the things that comes with warfare when I get hit with it, with spiritual attack is, I did it. I blew it. I did something to bring this on. I'm the schmuck. You know, nobody else lives under this stuff. It's just me. That always comes with it, doesn't it? That's your thing too, right? You did something to deserve this. No, you have an enemy, right? You must fight. You must break these agreements that you've been making. What he's looking for is an agreement. When he comes with this spin, when he came with those wounds and the message of your wounds when you were young or the failures, or the divorce, or whatever it was, when he comes with his spin into it, he's hoping that you'll buy it. He's hoping that something in your heart will say, yeah, that's true. That's an agreement. You make an agreement with it, and then pow, he stays. He just sets up camp there, and he works that thing for years. I had an amazing Normal day experience when I was taking a couple friends fishing last year. I only see these guys once or twice a year. They live out of town. And, and so we're just driving out. We're just driving along, going fishing, you know. But I sensed that Jesus wanted to do something. And it was father, son and the father's life. And so we just kind of got to talking. Let me describe this guy a little bit. This guy dominates every conversation. You know, guys like that, he just talks a lot over people. And he's just kind of, he's sort of always kind of needing, needing to assert himself. And he goes into these long explanations to explain himself that are really hard to follow. You know, it's just, it, it's hard to pay attention, hard to listen to, kind of bugs you after a while. You want to dismiss him, write him off, you know. And he's always trying to defend himself, always. So anyway, that's the background. So we're driving along and and we're just kind of talking about life and stuff. And somehow we got to talking about his life and about his struggles and feeling isolated and and alone and and just struggling in his marriage and some different things. And uh, I just said, you know what, let's just ask Jesus about this. Let's ask Jesus where all of this is coming from. I think it's all related. And he says, okay, so we're driving along. We pray, and I hear the word misunderstanding. 
misunderstanding. And so I said to my friend, I said, uh, what I'm hearing Jesus say is misunderstanding. Does that ring true? Does that make sense to you? He's speechless. He can barely talk. He's getting choked up. He says, I have felt misunderstood my entire life. Okay, now the spiritual warfare around me, confusion, doubt, shut up, don't go there. You're such a poser. This will never work. You know, just all of that. You know, and so I'm getting hit with this stuff. So I'm like, jackpot. We are on to it here, right? If, if I have pissed off the enemy, we're going after this thing. We're, we're getting close to it. Somebody is freaking out here, right? And so I said, really, misunderstanding, huh? I said, so is that why you're always trying to defend and explain yourself and stuff? And he's like, I do that? <laughs> I'm like, be gentle, be kind. <laughs> I'm like, you do it a lot, actually. <laughs> anyway, praying, talking, kind of thing. Here's what's amazing. So we asked Jesus, where did this start? Where did this come from, Jesus? Can you help us? You know, and I'm just getting hit with confusion and this is stupid and don't go there and, you know, just go fishing. I'm just kind of getting hit with that. And uh, we're praying and he says, uh, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Now, this is not a super dialed in guy to this stuff. And he's going, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And I'm, I'm looking in the rear view mirror. And I'm like, are you OK? And he says, I just remembered. And he tells this incredible story of the night that he received Christ. He was 12 years old. And he had gone to church with a friend. His parents didn't attend church. Family weren't believers. And he received Christ. He was Baptist church. I surrender all. He's down there in front. He comes to Christ. And it was joyous. He was so excited. And he comes home and he tells his dad, Dad, you're not going to believe what happened to me. His father goes into a rage. Rages against him. Wound, right? And a spirit of misunderstanding with the wound, right? We're talking 45 years later, we're having this conversation. And this has dominated his marriage, his business. This has dominated his life, right? The wound, never known, acknowledged, the struggle, not really aware of, the warfare, clueless, right? Be on your alert. He's prowling, looking for an opportunity to devour, right? Spirit of misunderstanding. We pray, and what we needed to pray about was this. He had made a deep and profound agreement with it. And the agreement was something like, I blew it. I don't know what I did wrong. This boy, the 12, is trying to figure out, was it wrong to accept Jesus? Why is my dad raging against me? Is it wrong to defy him? Confusion. And the agreement was, I will always be misunderstood. That was the lie, but he had just made this deep agreement with it. Yup. That was it. And then it just it allowed the enemy permission. So what he's looking for, this accuser, is he's looking for agreements in your life. He's looking for, the, for you to make an agreement with things. It's an extraordinary story here uh, several years ago. A uh, missionary, older uh, man, great man, um, came to the incredible revelation just sitting in this session. He's like an agreement. And he's starting to put two and two together. And, and the quick story there is he had come back from the mission field. And after a couple of weeks, he was still really exhausted. And he knew he was past the jet lag. And so he went to the doctor. He's like, malaria? Or did I pick up a bug or something? When a doctor checks him out. No, you're fine. But then the doctor sits him down. He says, look. He says, you know, you're, you're getting older. You're not a young man anymore. Maybe you're just tired. Enemy trying to get in to put his interpretation on things. And he goes, well, maybe I'm just tired. Okay. Three times the same thing happens. He's talking to his wife about it. She says, well, honey, you're not a young man anymore. Maybe you're just tired. Huh? Maybe I'm just tired. Okay. Friend of his, you know, same thing. Maybe I'm just tired. I think he's sitting here going, oh my gosh, I have made an agreement with just that. I'm old. I'm tired. I'm kind of out of the game. I've had my day. Right. So he goes outside during one of the quiet times and he breaks the agreement. And this tiredness, this malaise just lifts off of him. 
It's not true. It wasn't true. It was the spin, the interpretation, the accuser coming in to pin his heart down. I'll tell you a thousand stories like that. A thousand stories. Bart's got this amazing story. Are you going to tell your crash story? Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, do you mind? Okay. Unbelievable story. Bart. Phenomenal pilot, 30 years, you know, behind the stick, all of that, uh, buys a new uh, plane a couple years ago, and he's on his test checkout flight thing with the factory and the, and the sign-off with the instructor, and it's uh, foul weather in Pennsylvania, and the uh, runway's icy, and he's coming in for a landing, and, and all of his, his former airplanes didn't have reverse thrust, but this is a turbine, and it does, so he pulls the throttle back, and then he pulls it all the way back into reverse thrust. Yeah, slam onto the runway, sliding down. Instructors convinced that they're about to flip and catapult into the trees. He thinks it's all over. Bart, in the airplane, is yelling at himself. I mean, this, this is a crash. This is a life and death situation, but he didn't even focus on that. The contempt is there. And he is yelling at himself, you worthless piece of shit. And he's telling us this story about the crash and we go after that. We're like, whoa, 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 what was that? When God shows Bart this incredible wound that he had been carrying from his brother. His brother used to beat him up and call him a worthless piece of shit, right? Wound, message, and some deep agreement with it of shame, self-reproach, contempt. Bam, the enemy's right there, pinning his heart down under shame and under self-reproach for years. It takes a crisis to surface it. It often does, right? You notice what comes out there. And again, incredible time of prayer of breaking agreements with that. That is not true. I belong to God. I'm bought with a price. I'm my father's son, right? And breaks the agreement with it and... <gasps> It's like you're up for air. It's like somebody turns the lights on for the first time. You're like, oh my gosh, I've been living under that for how long now? Do you see how this works? In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul warns. He says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Y'all probably are familiar with this passage. But listen, he says, and do not give the devil a foothold. Okay, Paul's writing to believers, and he's warning. Now, anger's not it. It's not like the big sin or some special deal. It's the example. And Paul is saying, when you let the sun go down on this stuff, when you just bury it, right? Don't deal with it, mishandle it. When you make deep and profound agreements with it, what happens? Yes, your enemy... These foul spirits get a foothold in your life. Paul's warning against that. Whoa, you got to deal with this stuff. Don't let that happen. It'll pin your heart down for years. It'll affect your relationships, your career, your health. Right? It'll affect your walk with God deeply and profoundly. Okay? And so in James chapter 4, verse 7, the brother of Jesus repeats... Peter's admonition, right? Submit, therefore, to God, he says, and do what? Resist, resist. You are commanded to resist. There is this terrible teaching that's got into the church that you're not to do anything about this, that that's Jesus's job, right? Don't resist. My son heard this in his Bible class. Oh, it's Jesus's job to resist the devil. You don't do that. No, it, you're told to. You're commanded to. Right? All through the scriptures, it's modeled for you. You're shown how to do it. Why are you told to put on the armor of God if you're not at war? And why are you told to put on the armor of God if you're not supposed to use it? What are you given a sword for if you're not supposed to attack something and hack it up? You see what I'm saying? This passivity, this ennui, this just this, oh, oh, I don't, don't want to deal with this. Right? That's the warfare, actually. Even that taking you out because you resist this, the promise is, and he will flee from you. Oh, you can get the victory. 
you can get phenomenal victory in your life. You will be amazed how much ground can be taken if you'll just simply accept reality for what it is and you begin to learn to be a warrior. You begin to learn.